What I'm about to do is destroy this target and free you to a different style of living. Now, when I say I'm going to destroy this target, I want to tell you right now, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life telling you that you're crazy if you do this. So if you want to do this, that's fine. And go ahead with it, but you're not going to enjoy the rest of the sermon series as much. Because I'm going to show you an alternative way to making decisions and trying to figure out what God's will is for you. And I'm also going to be humble enough to say that that may mean I'm wrong on this idea, even though I don't think so, and I'll show you why in a second. But I will say, if this is the way you want to go about trying to make decisions, trying to make sure that all the signs add up, you've got peace with the decision, and this is the only way to make sure you're honoring God, then I will say to you what Mordecai said to Esther. Esther 4, verse 14, telling her that if she remains silent, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place. In other words, God will do what God sovereignly wants to do. But you and your father's family will perish. Not that part, the last side. And who knows? Maybe you have come to just as such a time as this. Maybe this is how God reveals himself and his individual will for your life. But you know what I think it is? I think it's the easy way for us to sometimes not have to ever make a decision. I think it's sometimes us abusing Bible stories and trying to bring principles out of them that aren't necessarily true. Eliezer said, if you do this, then I know that you have favored Abraham. Is that really the grand sign of God's favor with Abraham is that he gets a daughter-in-law? No. Chapter 12, God fully showed up and revealed himself to Abraham before Abraham knew him and said, you're favored. I have chosen you out of everybody on the earth. You're going to be the father of many great nations. That's a sign God favors you. There's concrete revelation of God. Gideon says, after being called by God to do these things, tell you what, God, if you'll just do this one thing, then I know. At what point can't we just trust that when God said, go do these things, to go do these things? See, I think what we need to do instead of trying to find this target is change the target. I think the target that really exists is this. God has a moral will, and God has a sovereign will, and we're to live in between both. Which means our lives are to be lived in a way that honors God by how we live and how we act. And when God decides to intervene, God can and God will. But until then, here's what God wants you to do. God wants you to trust who he is and live accordingly. And you say, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to trust in how I think. Let's go back and look at Proverbs 3 by looking at the context of verses 5 and verse 6. It starts in chapter 3, verse 1, where the writer is speaking of wisdom, which he has already said comes from its source as God. And he says this, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my, what? Commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years, and they'll bring you prosperity. In other words, the general way in which God has revealed himself is the way of life. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust that his commands are true. Trust them. Trust what he has revealed. Don't decide, like everybody else, to go ahead and create your own model and morals for living. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. How has he made our paths straight? By showing us the straight path. How to live. Now, this is either the most scary thing you've ever heard said from a pulpit, or this is the most freeing thing. I'll give you a choice again. If you want to stay in the land of trying to always figure out circumstance, just laugh at the next few weeks and just enjoy communion and singing and your time with others. But if you'd like to see how do I begin to live the way God has commanded us to live morally, and then how does that affect how I choose to do the things I choose, then that's where we go from here.
Now, here's what that means. Rachel, this now relieves you of pressure if you follow my advice. The one you marry on your wedding day is now the one. There is no second guessing that. Even on days when your heart starts maybe feeling like maybe this wasn't the one. <laughs> and apparently some married people know what I'm talking about already. This gives us the freedom to say, you know what, there's another job out there. If I take it, I take it. If I stay, I stay. But that's not the point. The question is, what kind of person and employee am I, whether I stay here or whether I go there? And we quit blaming God for running away from our problems. Or we quit blaming God for dealing with crazy things. Because there are two different ways, by the way, that people confirm in their heart whether this is something of God. There's the nice, happy, smiley guy who speaks to junior high and high school kids at a camp week and tries to help them discover this and tells them that you know it's God's will when everything in life is sunflowers, roses, and butterflies. And everything is just great and perfect. God bless youth ministers. Anyway, and then you get the other kind. Those who have interpreted their understanding of God's will out of the Beatitudes with only one Beatitude. Blessed are you when you're persecuted and everybody speaks evil of you. And they're convinced that they're only in God's will when, guess what? Life is miserable. Why? Because you lean on God and his understanding. No matter how bad life is, clearly this is the path that God has led you down. Or is there a balanced alternative that says... Into this life, sometimes God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous in any situation. But how do I choose to live? How do I keep these commands and follow them? Which means, how does this come in when your heart is wavering in a marriage? How does this come in when that child, whether he was born in an airplane or born at home is suddenly one that instead of being a blessing to you, you're starting to wonder how much time would I have to do if they disappear? How do you live when work is great? And how do you live when it's, well, work and labor? How do we begin to make decisions in our lives that we can say clearly this is within God's will? Now, you have two choices to make. Some of you will not like the next few weeks, and that's okay. Others of you, I hope this is an enlightened, refreshing view that kind of frees up some of the tension of wondering, is God happy with me right now? By the way, the short answer is yes, his son died for you. The big answer is he's still working on you, so there's some things that maybe not, but we'll try to see how we make decisions to work towards that maturity we're supposed to be. Hate to blow that part, but I want to comfort some of you before we leave. And for some of you, the comfort I want to give is the opportunity for you to give your life and live for Jesus and begin to put these principles into place from the very beginning. If this morning you would like to make a decision to live for Jesus, we invite you as we sing Living for Jesus. Would you stand in case there's someone near you or in case you need to come 